From Chicago, Illinois, the Voice of Prophecy presents live The Midnight Cry with Kenneth Cox, an adventure in understanding where we are in the light of Bible prophecy. Heavenly Father, tonight as we take a look at this country that is dear to each of us, we pray that you will give us the understanding that we need that we might see your hand, how you have guided, led, that we might understand the blessings that you've poured out. We pray, Lord, that each one of us here tonight may simply open our hearts to you, follow the leading of your spirit, and that all of us may rejoice in the salvation that we find in Christ. For this we pray in your name. Amen. There has never been a nation in the history of mankind that's been as blessed as the United States of America. Actually, this country has received the blessing of God, even Israel, in the height of the reign of David and Solomon, never saw the blessings that you have had the privilege of seeing. God has abundantly, marvelously blessed this country. God mentions nations primarily for two reasons. He mentions them because of the influence they have upon the world, and secondly, because of their effect upon the people of God. The United States is no different. As we have looked at the scripture night after night, it speaks of these different nations. Revelation 17, verse 10, and it says, There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is. The other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. And so as we have looked at God's word and we've looked at these beasts one after another, we have found out that they represent different nations. Remember, we found out that Babylon of old represented as the image, the head of the image, also as the lion. Scripture represented Babylon. That's one head of the lion. You remember then we came to Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia was the arms and breast of silver on the image, and you remember as we studied Daniel, the seventh chapter, it was presented as a bear. That is the second head. And put it together, folks. Babylon fell to Medo-Persia. Babylon fell to Medo-Persia, all right? Then came the country of Greece represented on the image as the belly and thighs of bronze. And you remember in Daniel, the seventh chapter, it was presented as a leopard that had four wings and four heads, represented the swiftness with which Alexander the Great took everything that was before him. And then you remember we came to the fourth kingdom, the legs of iron, represented in Daniel 7 as a dragon. Pagan Rome ruled that period of time. And then you remember we came to a fifth beast in Revelation the 13th chapter as a nondescript beast that I'm going to be saying a little more about tonight. We'll talk about it in reference to our subject tonight. And then you remember if you were with me the other night, we talked about the sixth beast and that sixth beast was that of atheism or communism that rose, you remember, and came in when Napoleon came in and overthrew, uh, overthrew the papal power. And then you remember after that we came to uh, our subject for tonight. That's what we're looking at tonight. Now... As we take a look at that, it tells us this very clearly in Revelation 17 and verse 10. And when he comes, he must continue a, what? Short time. So it says that this seventh beast that you and I are going to look at tonight, that when he comes, he must continue a short 
time. Okay, so we want to put that together and see exactly what the scripture is saying about it. Now, you remember when we studied this beast in Revelation, the 13th chapter, this nondescript beast that had seven heads, ten horns, we identified that as the papal power because it makes it very clear in scripture and in history that the papal power fell to pagan Rome, or pagan Rome fell to the papal power. Okay, I want to put things in a time sequence for us tonight so that you can see exactly how this fits together. So we're going to go to Revelation 13, and let's read a few texts here. It says here in Revelation 13, 1, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. So this is this nondescript beast that rose up out of the sea that we identified, we gave you eight points of identification that the scripture identified without any question of doubt as that of papal Rome. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. And you remember as we studied that, we found that papal Rome got its power, its seat, and its authority from that of pagan Rome. Okay, that all took place step by step. Now, as we continue, watch, happen, watch what happens here because it says in verse 10, he who leads into captivity will what? go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So the scripture is saying clearly that this beast in Revelation 13, which was that of the papal power, it said that it took people into captivity, it would go into captivity. It says that it killed with the sword, therefore it would be killed with the sword. And we find out that Napoleon, Napoleon is wanting to control Europe, but Napoleon knows that he cannot control Europe unless he can break the back of the papal power. So Napoleon, on February the 15th, 1798, sent his general Berthier into Rome in which he overthrew the papal power, and as history says, he established a secular one. Okay, you with me? Now, I want you to watch very, very carefully because this is the first beast of Revelation 13, but in that 13th chapter is a second beast that it says this about it. Revelation 13, verse what? 11. I just read to you verse 10 that says, He that goeth into captivity or leadeth into captivity, shall go into captivity. He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. That is verse 10. Verse 11 reads this way. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. So what it is saying here is just as this one beast in Revelation 13 is going down, going into captivity, he said, I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, spake as a dragon. What I am trying to tell you tonight, dear friend, is there is only one power on the face of the whole earth that fits that time sequence. No other power does. I don't care how much you want to talk about it. You can take God's word and there is only one nation, one power that will fit that time sequence and none other. You watch very carefully. Napoleon sent his general A into Rome on February the 15th, 1798, and that power, the nondescript beast, the first beast of Revelation 13, went into captivity. Watch what happens now. As this beast here, as this beast in Revelation 13 is going into captivity, the scripture says this beast is coming up. I saw another beast rising out of the earth. Are you acquainted with a man by the name of John Wesley? Do you know who I'm talking about? 
You know who I'm talking about if I talk about John Wesley? John Wesley is basically the one that started the Methodist Church. A, a great preacher, a great preacher of righteousness, John Wesley, as he studied the Scripture, and he studied particularly the books of Daniel and Revelation, uh, John Wesley would make notes about it. I, I don't know, he just wrote it on pieces of paper and notes. And when John Wesley died, they gathered all those notes up and published them. And so you can buy a book called Notes on Revelation by John Wesley. When you read what John Wesley has to say about these two beasts that we're looking at tonight, I want you to notice something very interesting because this is what John Wesley says. He is not yet come. Now, John Wesley is saying that second beast to Revelation 13, the two-horned beast, is not yet come, though he cannot be far off, for he is to appear at the end of the 42 months of the first beast. He said he can't be very far off because he's to appear at the end of the 42 months of the first beast. The 42 months of the first beast came to an end when, friends? 1798. Did you notice when John Wesley wrote this? 1754. 1754, John Wesley wrote, can't be very far off because he's got to come at the end of the 42 months of the first beast. In other words, John Wesley understood what God's Word was saying. He was right there. He knew what was taking place. So just exactly as one was going down, the other one, Scripture says, was going to come up. Watch. For you remember, trouble has developed between the colonies and England. England has not given to our forefathers uh, the right to govern as they'd like to govern. And you remember they decided they wanted to be a independent nation. You remember that? Huh? And so they wrote up something called the Declaration of Independence. Remember that? You remember our forefathers, our forefathers came over to this country looking for a place where they could worship as they pleased, where they could build a new life. And those people were called pilgrims, and they came over here, and they landed at a place called Plymouth Rock. And you remember they moved there on Plymouth Rock. Now, if you don't think that God had a hand in this, let me share something with you. Uh, if you ever get the opportunity, you should go up to Plymouth and go there and take a look. They've rebuilt the village there where the people lived. And when you go in and talk to them, you can only talk to them about things back then. And so it's most interesting. But by the way, you remember there was another town that was established here in this country. You know what the name of it was? Jamestown. Jamestown completely was wiped out three times. So how was it that Plymouth Rock was able to make it? It's because when those people got off the ship, folks, they found buildings there with food in them and nobody living there. I'm talking about the hand of God and what he did. The pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock when? 1620. 1620, they landed at Plymouth Rock, and they begin to set up their livelihood. They begin to build, and then as it developed, as I mentioned, England was not given the right to rule like they thought they ought to be able to, and so we decided that we wanted to be an independent nation, and we drew up the Declaration of Independence. When? 17... 76, are you putting things together? 1776, you have the Declaration of Independence. 1789, you have the Bill of Rights. 1791, you have the Bill of Rights adopted. 1798, that first beast goes into captivity. 
and you have another nation rising. Dear friend, there's not another power, not another nation on earth that fits that time sequence, only the United States. So as this one is coming up out of the earth. Now this text that we've read in Revelation, the 13th chapter and verse 11 is a very important one. It has a lot of information in it. And it says this, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, spake as a dragon. Had two horns like a lamb, right? Now you see, all the beasts that we've been studying about, they came up out of the what? Huh? Out of water. But this beast is coming up out of the earth. And we read here in Revelation, the 17th chapter, in verse 15, it says, And he said unto me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. The one beast after another rose up out of a revolution or war. That's the way they came into being. Now, all of a sudden, we have a beast that is coming up out of the earth. You see, this country, this country came into existence just exactly like it says on the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty has this to say about it. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuge of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless tempters tossed to me. I lift up my lamp beside the golden door. That's exactly how this country was settled. Your forefathers, my forefathers, they came over to this country and they settled it. That's why it says that it rose up out of the earth. It wasn't the result of a revolution among the people. It was because they came over here and they settled this country, moved here because they wanted to be able to worship and they wanted to be able to rule as they thought they ought to be able to. That's why the scripture says that it rose up out of the earth. Then again in Revelation 13 verse 11, it says, I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, spake as a dragon. You see, in the Bible, horns on a beast represent the source of power. Sometimes those horns have crowns on them, meaning that that particular power would be ruled by a monarch. Sometimes they don't have crowns on them, and so that those horns just represent the type of power that it's based on. This country was established on two principles. Two principles. Our forefathers came over here and they said, we want government by the people, for the people, and through the people. They said, this is the kind of government that we want. That was one principle upon which our country was established. The other principle that our country was established upon was that that they would give to every man and every woman the right to worship according to the dictates of their conscience. And those were the two principles that this country was built on, was that we would have a country. They said, we want a country without a king. We want government by the people. I don't know what you learned when you went to school, but when I was going to school, they told me that the reason our forefathers rebelled against uh, England was over taxation. Is that what you were told? Uh, didn't you read about the Boston Tea Party? Huh? Yeah, they, they said that, you know, the taxation was heavy. Ha have you ever gone back and read the taxation back then, huh? Have you ever done that? You ought to. It's very interesting. Man, I would accept it today with open arms. I can tell you for sure, gladly. But I want you to listen. This is what our forefathers tell us was the problem. I don't know if you've ever read about a man by the name of Josiah Quincy, but Josiah Quincy is also one of those that signed the Declaration of Independence. And this is what he had to say. In defense of our 
civil and religious rights. Are you seeing the two principles? That our country was established upon in defense of our civil and religious rights with the God of army on our side, we fear not the hour of trial. Though the host of our enemies should cover the field like locusts, yet the sword of the Lord and of Gideon shall prevail. Those were the two principles upon which our country was established, and England was not given the right to govern as they should, and it was not given the right to worship like they wanted to, and thus they said, we will have our own country. Do you remember another man by the name of... Uh, Patrick Henry, you remember him? Do you remember what he said? Uh, give me liberty or give me death. What else did he say? Nobody never knows. They, they know that and that's it. I want to read to you what Patrick Henry had to say. We shall not fight alone. God presides over the destiny of nations and will raise up friends for us. The battle is not to the strong alone, it is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? You see, this is the problem. England was not given the right to govern as they felt they wanted to govern. England was not given the right to worship like they felt they should be able to worship. And they said, no, we won't do this. We'll have our own nation. Forbid it, almighty God. Give me liberty or give me death. Those were the two principles upon which this nation was established. Those two principles, dear friends, have held us in good stead down through the years. And God help us if we give them up. Stand on those two principles. But it goes on, speaking of this two-horned beast, and it says, Then I saw another beast coming up from the earth, out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Now, when you pick up God's Word and you begin to study it, what does a lamb represent? In the Bible, what does the lamb represent? Well, let's look. This is kind of what it tells us it represents. 1 Peter, the first chapter, verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You see, it represents Jesus Christ. Revelation 5, verse 12. Same with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom. In the Bible, a lamb represents Jesus. And when it says that this beast that rose up out of the earth had two horns like a lamb, it meant that it would be young. It meant that it would be gentle, but it also meant that it would be Christ-like. You see, our forefathers that came over here were God-fearing men and women. They believed in the Word of God, and they built this nation and established it upon biblical principles. And dear friend, tonight, if you go to Washington, D.C., and you walk through the halls of Congress, and you visit the Senate, and walk through the Capitol, you'll find God written everywhere. You can walk through the parks, and it's written everywhere, because our forefathers were God-fearing men and women, and they believed in God, and they took their stand there. When the war took place between the United States and England, that revolution was so hard on the colonies that it separated all of them. I mean, it separated the communication between the colonies. And you may not have realized it, friends, but that war bankrupted every one of the colonies. I mean, totally bankrupted them. And each one of the colonies felt like that they had lost everything and they had put everything into the war and they couldn't communicate with the other colonies and so they felt like they had borne the weight of the war themselves. So when the war was over 
and they called a constitutional congress. And delegates came from the 13 colonies. When they arrived, they were not in any frame of mind to get along. They got in argument after argument after argument until finally the delegation from New York went home. And it looked like that whole Constitutional Congress was going to fall apart when a little man wearing glasses stood up and he had this to say. We have not hitherto once thought of humbly applying to the Father of lights to illuminate our understanding. In the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, we were sensible to danger and we had daily what? Prayer. Prayer. I'm talking about these were God-fearing men and women and when they were in the midst of that, con that conflict, they had daily prayer in this room for divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard and they were graciously answered. Do we imagine that we no longer need his assistance? I have lived, sir, a long time and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs the affairs of men. And with that speech, Benjamin Franklin was able to congeal that whole congregational, that whole constitutional congress and those men sat down and they wrote one of the greatest documents that has ever been written by man. Why? Because they were God-fearing men and women. They believed in the Lord. That's why the beast is lamb-like. Even when they came, to electing the first president of this country. And George Washington stood and gave his inaugural address. I want you to listen to a few paragraphs from it. It would be particularly improper to omit. In the first official act of my fervent supplication to the Almighty Being who rules over the universe, who presides in the council of nations and whose providential aid can supply every human defect, that his benediction may consecrate to the liberties and the happiness of the people of the United States. No people, listen, no people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the invisible hand which conducts the affairs of men more than the people of the United States. Oh, he said, if there's any people on earth that ought to be aware of God and what God has done, it's the people of the United States. Every step, every step by which we have advanced to an independent nation seems to have been distinguished by some token of providential agency. He said, every step that we made there was evidence there always of what God was doing. We ought to be no less persuaded that the propitious smile of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. You see, they were men and women that believed in God. They were men and women who believed in the word of God and they built this nation on principle, Christian principles. That's why it says that it was lamb-like. Unfortunately, it doesn't stop there. I wish tonight that it did. I wish that it just stopped right there and I didn't have to say any more. But that text in Revelation, the 13th chapter and verse 11, ends up by saying this. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Now, folks, if the lamb, if the lamb represents Jesus, who does the dragon represent? 
Yeah, just the opposite. Just the opposite. Now, if you, if you don't understand what's been happening for the last 20, 25 years, then I would tell you tonight that we're in the process of it changing character. That's what's going on. That it is moving from that of a lamb to the place that it will speak as a dragon. Now, nations are very much like men. You see, nations are built on the wisdom and the might of man. That's how they're built. And because nations are built on the wisdom and the might of men, nations rise and they go down. That's the way all of them do. Almost every nation that has ever come into existence has come into existence out of bondage. We were in bondage to England. That's where we, we, where we were. Uh, you can find that Russia, right tonight, is just coming out of bondage, that she was in bondage to communism for 70 years. But always out of bondage comes spiritual faith. That always comes. Our forefathers felt they were in bondage, and they began to pray, and they began to seek God, that God would hear their prayer and would open up the way, and always, always out of spiritual bondage comes, my friends, courage. Like Patrick Henry said, listen, if I can't worship as I want to worship, if I can't follow God, if we cannot govern like we think we ought to govern, then give me liberty or give me death. They great courage and they stand up and they say, this is what we are going to do. You find much of that happening in Russia today. Spiritual faith. There has been a tremendous revival across Russia to God and as out of that has come spiritual faith and out of that has grown courage and out of courage always comes liberty. Dear friend, let me tell you something. There's no place on earth where this word has been preached where people have gone in and they've taught the people the word of God and people have accepted the word of God that there hasn't developed courage and out of that has come liberty. No place on earth where that hasn't happened. God's word always, always brings liberty. And out of liberty, out of liberty always comes abundance. You have had the privilege of living in a society where there has been an abundance. You go down to the store, there is infinite amount of choices. I mean, not just in different items, but tremendous amount of choices concerning one particular item. Because there is an abundance, and you've lived in a time of abundance. God has marvelously blessed you. I mean, beyond what you and I can even imagine. And if you don't think he hasn't, then you need to travel a little bit. And this need to go in some other places in the world, and you'll understand very clearly that God has blessed you abundantly. Unfortunately, you would think that when people are blessed and people are given so much that God has given, you would think that their heart would overflow with generosity and they would give. But unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Out of abundance comes selfishness. Instead of giving, they keep. Instead of sharing, they hoard. Completely different thing. Now, dear friends, what I'm trying to tell you tonight, and you be the judge, I want to ask you, do you think that the United States is uh, going up this side? Or do you think she's coming down on the other side? You see, out of selfishness, 
because we're selfish and we don't share and we don't give, out of that grows compliance. Uh, just, just go and go along. Uh, do you ever hear somebody say, oh, you can't, you can't beat City Hall. Uh, just go along with it. You're, it, you're not going to change anything. Compliance. And out of compliance, just being willing to go along, not willing to stand up and be counted, not willing to make any kind of waves, out of that always comes apathy. Always. Just saying, you know, don't disturb me. Uh, don't, don't get me out of my comfort zone. Uh, I want to be right here. Uh, leave me alone. Things are real good. I don't want to be bothered. And thus we have apathy. And out of apathy always comes dependence. Always comes dependence. See, 96% of all of you here in this room will retire dependent upon the United States government. Dependent. And out of dependency always comes bondage. And so we make the great circle. We go from bondage into bondage. And when it says that this beast would speak as a dragon, then, dear friend, this is what brings about the beast speaking as a dragon. There's another man that uh, signed your Declaration of Independence. You may not be acquainted with him. His name was Alexander Tyler. He made a statement that's tremendously important. I want you to listen to the statement that he made. Democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. Democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. Why not? Let's see why it can't. It can only exist until the voters discover that they can vote themselves money from the public treasury. The moment the people understand that they can vote themselves from money from the public treasury, democracy is headed downhill. Listen to this statement because we're right in the middle of an election, right? You want to see something? Watch this carefully. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidate who promises the most benefit from the public treasury. So you want to take a look at the candidates and you want to see which one's going to promise you the most and that's the one you're going to vote for. Say, oh, he'll, he'll give me more. I'll, I'll vote for him. And simply by doing that, you're sending your nation downhill. As a result, a democracy always collapses over loose financial policy and is always followed by dictatorship. The nation, you see, wrecks itself financially, and the only way it can be brought out of that is by dictatorship. The average age of the world's greatest powers has been 200 years. You and I have had the blessing of going a little longer than 200 years, okay? So we find ourselves with this nation that rose, that was lamb-like. We find it now speaking as a dragon. I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and spake or spoke like, like a dragon. Watch. Watch very carefully because this God is now going to show you What's going to happen, friends? It's going to show you exactly what's going to happen. And let me tell you something. This book hasn't failed. And it's not going to fail in the future. 
And when God says, this is going to happen, you better rest assured it's going to take place, just as God said it would. You remember a president called Richard Nixon? Huh? You know who he is, don't you? You remember him? He wrote a book called Seize the Moment. Uh, not too concerned about the title. It's the subtitle that I want you to look at. The subtitle says this, America's Challenge in a One Superpower World. You see, when communism fell, all of a sudden the United States found itself as a superpower unchallenged. How are we as a nation relating to that? South Bend Tribune newspaper, this is what it reported. In a broad new policy statement that is in its final drafting state, the Defense Department asserts that America's political and military mission in the post-Cold War era will be to ensure that no rival superpower is allowed to emerge in Western Europe, Asia, or the territory of the former Soviet Union. In other words, the United States says, we are a superpower and we're not going to let any other nation rise to rival us. In other words, the scripture says that she will speak as a dragon. She will speak as a dragon, and that's where we are. Now watch, because the scripture is going to help you put some things together. Revelation, we're still in the 13th chapter. We're looking at verse 14. Watch very carefully what it says. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which it was granted to which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Now this is talking about the two-horned beast, and it says that it was able to do certain things in sight of this first beast, okay? Which was the nondescript beast that had seven heads, two horns. Why? I mean seven heads and ten horns. Watch telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Now it says that this first beast, the one that went down, led into captivity, it was wounded by the sword and it what? It lived and therefore it says this two-horned beast is going to make an image to it. Well, that first beast we found out to be Papal Rome. That first beast, that two-horned beast, was Papal Rome. Not the two-horned beast, excuse me. The, the beast with seven heads, ten horns, the first beast of Revelation 13, that was Papal Rome. And it says that this two-horned beast that we're studying tonight is going to make an image to that beast. Now, I want to ask you something. If it's going to make an image, if you're going to make an image of a dog, you make it look like a cat, right? Huh? If you're going to make an image of a dog, you make it look like what? A dog. Okay, so it says that this beast is going to make an image to this other beast. The papal power stood for what? What made it the papal power? It made it a papal power because it was a union of church and state. It was a religio-political power. So therefore, it says that if this country is going to make an image to it, you've got to have church and state coming together. Watch. Because it says that this beast here is going to make an image to this beast. Okay? Watch what's beginning to de develop. This is a statement taken from the moral majority. This is what they have to say. Separation of church and state is a dangerous concept. Separation of church and state, they say, is a dangerous concept. This is because the phrase separation of church and state is not found in the Constitution. 
And the misuse of the phrase leads to all sorts of troubles, such as trying to keep godly principles out of legislation. Well, true enough, the word separation of church and state is not in our Constitution. But that doesn't mean that separation of church and state is a dangerous concept. At least our forefathers didn't think it was. It goes on and says, A thorough understanding of our Constitution is vital to our survival. Let's talk more like a Constitution and less like a bumper sticker. So it says that we, as a nation, need to bring church and state together. Let me read you another one. It says, wipe the phrase separa separation of church and state out of your vocabulary. I'm trying to tell you that there are moves today to bring church and state together. Another statement, W.A. Criswell. He said, I believe this notion of the separation of church and state was a figment of some infidel's imagination. And today, there are many things happening trying to bring church and state together. I don't know if you've read this book called After the Revolution by Ralph Reed. Ralph Reed was the head of Christian Coalition in which he said we need to bring church and state together. In fact, this is a statement that he made. If Christianity unites, we can do anything. We can pass any law or any amendment, that, and that's exactly what we intend to do. In other words, church today is becoming more involved. Now, let me explain something. This was a problem with our forefathers. Our forefathers came over here. They were looking for a place where they could worship as they wanted to. They were God-fearing men and women, and they came over and they settled this country, and when they settled it, they built it on Christian principles. And so when they got to putting together the Constitution, there was some of them that said, if you're not Christian, you can't vote. And there was a real movement in our country to try to exclude anybody who was not a Christian from voting. And our president, James Madison, fought that. And I mean he fought it hard, and this is what he said. I want you to listen to what he said. Because 15 centuries of ecclesiastical establishment has given birth to superstition, bigotry, and persecution. Said that was religious persecution. And this bill could do the same. You see, there was a bill introduced into Congress to try to say that only Christians could vote. Who does not see that if the same authority which can establish Christianity in exclusion of all other religions may establish with the same ease any particular sect of Christianity in the exclusion of all other sects? He said, we can't do this. And our forefathers put together a constitution that folks had balances and checks in it. They put together a constitution so that you and I could have religious freedom and at the same time to keep our country based on Christian principles. This is how they put together our country. And I think they did a pretty good job of it. And I think you and I need to be very careful. But listen, this is still speaking of the two-horned beast. Listen to what it says about him. And he was granted power to give what? Yeah. To give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. I've told you, any time, any time in history that a church has taken over civil power, it is always persecuted. Don't care what church that is, always. It says that this two-horned beast had power to give what? Breath to the image, right? Had breath. If you give breath to something, what, do you have, what does that mean? Huh? Well, it means it came to life. You've read the story of Pinocchio, okay? 
came to life. Here he made an image of a boy, and breath was given, and he came to life. That's what it's saying here, that they made an image to the beast, and he had power to give breath to it, and it came to life. And it says that he would cause it to speak, right? Speak and cause as many as would not worship the beast should be killed. Any time in God's word, friend, that you come across a beast, and it says concerning that particular beast that it would speak, that means legislation. That's what it's talking about. Beasts represent powers, nations. So when it says it speaks, that means it's going to legislate. And any time it says cause, that means enforcement. And so the Bible is saying very clearly, in this dear country in which you and I live tonight, the day will come in which you will find church will rule and there will be religious persecution. That's what it's saying. It says that we are approaching that, that that day will come. It will speak as a dragon. You will have unification of church and state. It would give life to the image of the beast that it would do things for that beast. Is there anything happening that way today? I hope, dear friend, that you're not uh, just home and you're letting some of these things pass by and you're not understanding what's going on. Time Magazine, February 24, 1992. One of his earliest goals as president, Reagan says, was to recognize the Vatican as a church. No, as a state and make them an ally. If you recognize them as a state, you have unification of what? Church and state. See, definitely movements that way. The United States probably blessed by God like no other country has ever been blessed by God. But it says that it will speak as a dragon. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is. The other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time in other words, when it speaks as a dragon, it's only going to last a short time. You and I are living right at the time when the scripture says it's going to speak as a dragon. You and I have had the privilege of living in a great nation. Fortunately, the wonderful thing about it is, is it's the seventh one. We're going to look at the eighth one, but it's all right down here at the end, and at the end, it says that Jesus is going to come back. It can't be far off. Let me tell you, dear friend, it won't be long. It won't be Let us pray. Heavenly Father, tonight 
as we've looked at this great nation. One in which you have blessed in a very special way. Lord, tonight we would pray for the president of our country. Lord, when he's sitting there in the Oval Office and he has to make a decision and he's listened to all the counsel and he doesn't know what he should do, we pray, Lord, that he might turn to you, that he might seek you and what you would have him to do, that you remember the senators, the legislators, the governors of our country. Give them wisdom, give them understanding. But Lord, we pray that as people, that each one of us here might humble ourselves before you, that we might seek you, that you might heal our land, and that our lives may be committed to following you in all that we do. For this we ask in Christ's name, amen.